Hello everyone, welcome back to Introduction to Financial Accounting 1 course. Uh, today we are looking at Chapter 8, which looks into fraud, internal control, and cash management. In this chapter, we would focus on 8 learning outcomes. We want to try to define fraud and internal control, uh, identify the principles of internal control activities, explain the applications of internal control principles to cash receipts, explain the applications of internal control principles to cash disbursements, describe the operation of a petty cash fund, indicate the control features of a bank account, prepare a bank reconciliation statement, and explain the reporting of cash. So let's get started in this chapter. So what is fraud? Fraud is a dishonest act by an employee that results in personal benefits to the employee at a cost to the employer or the company. There are mainly three factors that contribute to fraudulent activity. The presence of an opportunity, the rationalization, and financial pressures to that employee. When it comes to fraud prevention in the United States, we have what is called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. This applies to all publicly traded U.S. corporations uh, and it requires uh, or it is required to maintain a system of internal control in those companies. Uh, the corporate executives and boards of directors must ensure that these controls are reliable and effective and there must be an independent outside auditor that attest to the adequacy of the internal control systems that are put in place in the corporation. Sarbanes-Oxley Act was created um, or caused the creation of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. Now, internal control uh, measures have multiple purposes. First, to safeguard assets uh, and protect them from theft, to enhance the accuracy and reliability of accounting records, to increase efficiency of operations, and to ensure compliance with laws and regulations. Internal controls typically have five primary components, control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and finally, monitoring. So what are the principles of internal control activities? Well, we have uh, a few. First of all, establishment of responsibility. And this control is most effective when only one person is responsible for a specific task. The second of all is segregation of duties. And this related duties should be assigned to different individuals, meaning that for a, the achievement of a specific procedure, the um, the documents or the um, the um, the workflow should go through multiple uh, individuals in the organization, where each one of those individuals would have to verify uh, what was done by the employee that worked on that procedure beforehand. And the third one is documentation procedures. Uh, companies should use pre-numbered documents, and all documents should be accounted for and you probably noticed this already with like uh, receipts and uh, different uh, documents and corporations they would typically have serial numbers on uh, those uh, documents even if you go to a restaurant now and order some food you will uh, pay and then get a, a receipt that contains your order you would notice there were there will always be a uh, a serial order number on that receipt. There are typically some physical controls as well that you might might have noticed uh, around you uh, for uh, the existence of safes, vaults, and safety deposit boxes for cash and business papers, uh, having locked warehouses and storage cabinets for uh, stock and inventories uh, and records, having computer facilities with passkey access or fingerprints or eyeball scanners, uh, having uh, television monitors or camera monitors and garment sensors to deter theft. You notice that uh, whenever you go uh, uh, 
shopping for clothes, uh, time clocks for recording time worked for monitoring employees, and alarms to prevent uh, break-ins. Another uh, internal control activity that is typically practiced in corporations is having an independent internal verification uh, method put in place. Uh, this uh, um, person uh, typically checks the uh, assistant cashier's work and the accounting uh, department's work. Uh, the records periodically get verified by an employee who is independent. Uh, the uh, employee then uh, tries to dig through documents and um, records to find out uh, any discrepancies or any um, issues within those records and report those directly to management. If you notice any uh, missing amounts uh, or any um, numbers that are not reported uh, properly, they would directly report that to the management. Another internal control activity uh, re relates to human resource controls. Um, and there are some practices that human resource um, try to go through to deter and prevent any uh, fraud or issues within the business. Uh, these include bond employees, uh, rotating employees duties and require them to take vacations and conducting background checks for new hirees. Uh, the ones that we mentioned are all measures and activities that can be put in place in a corporation to limit uh, fraud. Uh, and the problem is with those internal controls that they are, they also have their own uh, limitations. So they cannot be 100% effective. Uh, some of those limitations to internal control measures include the costs, uh, high costs of implementing such systems, uh, should not exceed the benefits of implementing that system. So if I'm trying to prevent the theft of um, such amount of the business uh, on a daily basis, for example, I cannot put a system in place that would prevent that, but at the same time, it will cost me more than what is uh, uh, the amounts that are being uh, stolen or uh, being uh, fraudulently taken away of the business. Uh, the second thing is the human element. Uh, those systems on paper could be perfectly uh, capable of controlling um, the, uh, the, the business's environment and protecting it from fraud, but there is always a human element because humans are the ones who are practicing uh, those measures and those activities and mistakes could happen. And the third uh, limita limiting factor is the size of the business. So with smaller businesses, sometimes it's not uh, efficient or not possible to implement all of the internal controls uh, that are necessary to protect the business from fraud. Part of the internal control system, uh, there must be some practices to uh, help with cash control. Uh, so these uh, activities or systems include cash receipts controls, and some of these uh, uh, some of these practices include the segregation of duties, uh, just like with assets that we mentioned before. So different individuals receive the cash, uh, record cash receipts, and hold the cash. So the whole uh, the whole cycle cannot be put in one employee's hands because that will make it much easier for him uh, to uh, embezzle some money, right? Uh, another one is the establishment of responsibility. So only designated personnel are authorized to handle cash receipts. Have you probably noticed this maybe before in supermarkets or uh, when you go cloth, uh, uh, cloth shopping, you will notice that sometimes when the register uh, is closed. Uh, if you notice a trainee uh, over there, you'll notice they will ask for someone to unlock the uh, the cash register for them in order for them to uh, take in your cash, right? So each employee would have his own uh, unique login 
to be able to handle the cash and it cannot be given to all of the employees right uh, another one is the documentation procedure so using the remittance advice the mail receipts cash register tapes and deposit slips numbered uh, documents to help prevent uh, fraud cash controls also include human resource controls as we mentioned before bond personnel who handle the cash require employees to take vacations and conducting background checks on those employees uh, the existence of an independent internal uh, auditor or uh, a, a verification officer uh, those uh, count the cash receipts daily uh, treasurer compares the total receipts to the bank deposits on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and also having physical control so storing the cash in safes and bank vaults uh, limiting the access to storage areas and using cash registers one more cash control is called over-the-counter receipts and this um, dictates that important internal control principles such as segregation segregation of record keeping from physical custody are put in place of so notice uh, when you track down the journey of cash within a business you'll notice that there should be multiple employees who um, in which the transaction would uh, pass through right so we have here in the illustration in front of you the clerk who typically rings up the sales and counts the cash and then sends the cash to the cashier and the cashier counts the cash and prepares the deposit slip and then sends the deposit slip to the accounting department right whereas on the other side we have the supervisor who removes the locks uh, a cash register tape sends the cash register tape to the accounting department as well and where uh, the accounting department would record the journal entry in the company books and the actual cash would then be kept either in a safe uh, in the treasury safe or in uh, be deposited in the bank uh, uh, bank account of the company well uh, this one uh, does not really apply these days much um, because most uh, payments are either done electronically or through bank deposits but in case the company deals with uh, mail-in receipts so they receive cash through the mail and the mail receipts should be opened by at least two people uh, and a list must be prepared and each check endorsed each mail clerk signs the list to establish responsibility for the data uh, an original copy of the list along with the checks is sent to the cashier's department copy of the list is sent to the accounting department for recording uh, the clerks also keep a copy for themselves now we looked into uh, cash receipts controls now to the other side of, uh, of this matter uh, when it comes to cash disbursement control so when the company is actually paying out money now generally internal controls over cash disbursements is more effective when companies pay by check instead of cash okay uh, and those uh, include applications such as uh, implementing a voucher system or having a pity cash fund which we are going to talk about shortly and again for cash disbursement controls we also have some uh, measures to be put in place including segregation of duties establishment of responsibilities and documentation procedures and also human resource controls having an independent internal uh, verification verification procedure and having physical controls going back to some of the applications we mentioned before having voucher systems and pity cash funds uh, for the cash disbursement controls now the voucher system uh, is formed by having a network of approvals by authorized individuals to ensure all disbursements by check are proper a voucher is an authorization form prepared for each specific expenditure and the petty cash fund is typically used to pay for small amounts and this involves establishing a petty cash fund making payments from the fund and replenishing the fund 
Now, uh, whenever you make payments from the fund, you need to replace the cash that was dispersed by a receipt that proves that payment. Okay, and every now and again, that fund is replenished where those receipts are uh, submitted to the uh, accounting department and replaced by cash again to refill the petty cash fund. Now let's look at this example together to see how the petty cash fund is handled or recorded on the accounting books. Uh, this example it talks about Laird Company which decides to establish a $100 fund on March 1st. Uh, the journal entry for establishing a fund would look like this. You are going to debit petty cash account for the fund's amount and credit cash for that same amount. Now, assuming that a few days later, Laird's petty cash custodian requests a check for $87. The fund contains $13 cash and petty cash receipts for postage of $44, freight out of $38, and miscellaneous expenses for $5. The general journal entry would then be as follows. You're going to debit the postage expense for the $44, debit freight out for $38, and debit miscellaneous expense for $5, and credit the total of $87. Sometimes when the accountants handle the petty cash uh, funds records, they may need to recognize a cash shortage or overage. Now here we're going to assume that Laird's petty cash custodian has only $12 in cash in the fund plus the receipts as listed. The request for re reimbursement would therefore be for $88 and Laird would make the following entry. Now notice the, this is the similar entry from the one before. The only difference is we have $1 that is missing from the cash fund with no receipt to back it up. So in that case, the entry would be postage expense, 44 bucks, freight out for 38 bucks, miscellaneous expense for five bucks, and cash over and short for $1. This will be opposed to the cash entry on the credit side of $88. Another cash control measure is the use of bank. This contributes to good internal control over cash by minimizing the amount of currency on hand, creating a double record of bank transactions, and by the practice of uh, bank reconciliation every once in a while. Using a bank account for the company would entail having to make bank deposits uh, every once in a while and also withdrawing some uh, cash or through checks from that bank account. To make a bank deposit, there needs to be an authorized employee to make that deposit and uh, they would fill out a deposit slip. Now, that deposit slip would contain uh, many information including the amount, the company details and so on and the bank uh, or they should also have a list of the bank code numbers of the deposit checks that uh, were deposited with the amounts uh, that were deposited. On the other hand uh, it will also uh, typically uh, have to make payments from that bank account through writing checks. Now the written uh, uh, order signed by the depositor directing bank to pay the specified sum of money to a des designated recipient uh, through checks. Now those checks typically would contain the information of the maker and the payee and the payer, right? So it's pretty much just an order by the owner of the bank account to the bank to pay specific amount of money to someone. And of course, once the company has a bank uh, account, they would typically receive bank statements. The bank statement will contain the details of all the operations uh, and the financial activity of the bank account over a specified period of time.
and these will include some debit memorandum such as bank service charges or non sufficient funds uh, and also it will include some credit memorandum uh, such as collect uh, notes receivable and interest earned so the company accountants could use that statement to reconcile their records all right so they make they can use that to make sure that what they have on their um, books matches the bank statement and correct any errors that uh, took place uh, in their records now discrepancies between the company books and the bank statement might occur to either time lag or to recording errors okay so the accountant needs to uh, reconcile the balance per books and balance per bank to um, to correct any cash discrepancies right the reconciling items that occur because of time lags uh, include deposits in transit outstanding checks and bank memorandum and also we need to reconcile errors as well the bank reconciliation procedure is pretty simple uh, the accountant needs to have the cash balances per books and per bank statement and start with those and then take the uh, a cash or the cash balance uh, per bank statement and adjust it by adding any deposits in transit and subtracting any outstanding checks and adding or subtracting any errors that might have occurred from the bank itself on the other side uh, take the cash balance per books uh, and adjust it by adding any notes collected by the bank subtracting any non-sufficient fund or they call it check bounces okay and subtracting any check printing or other service charges that were not recognized before and adding or subtracting any book errors or errors that occurred in the recording process itself by the end of that they should have the correct balance matching between the bank statement and the accounting books of the company here is an example uh, the bank statement for Laird company in illustration 8-10 in your book shows a balance per bank of fifteen thousand nine hundred and seven dollars and forty five cents on April 30th 2012 on this date the balance of cash per books is eleven thousand five hundred and eighty nine dollars uh, and 45 cents so as you can see they don't uh, they don't match or the balances per bank statement and per our books don't match using the four reconciliation steps Laird determines the following reconciliation uh, items first step deposits in transit they noticed that on April 30th a deposit was received by the bank on May 1st uh, and that amount of two thousand two hundred and one dollars and forty cents second step outstanding checks they noticed that check number four hundred and fifty three of three thousand dollars and number four hundred and fifty seven of one thousand four hundred and one dollar and thirty cents and check number four hundred and sixty of one thousand five hundred and two uh, and seventy cents were not uh, were not recorded so they are just that uh, five, uh, with a total of five thousand nine hundred and four dollars step number three uh, checking for errors Laird wrote a check uh, check number 443 for 1226 and the bank correctly paid that amount however Laird recorded the check as 1262 dollars so they flipped the last two digits of the amount okay so they correct that by the difference between the two which is 36 dollars and finally step four with bank memoranda a debit uh, of a non-sufficient funds check from jr baron for 425 dollars and 60 cents a debit of the charge for printing company checks of 30 dollars that were not recognized by the company and finally credit to collection of notes uh, receivable for one thousand dollars plus interest earned of fifty dollars less the bank collection fees of fifteen dollars so that brings it total to one thousand three and thirty five dollars 
and this is how the uh, reconciliation would look like starting out with the cash balance per bank statement of fifteen thousand nine hundred seven dollars and forty five cents we add the deposit in transit of two thousand two hundred and one dollar and forty cents and we subtract outstanding checks of five thousand nine hundred and four dollars the adjusted cash balance per bank would be twelve thousand two hundred and four and eighty five cents on the other side the cash balance per books were given to us as eleven thousand five hundred eighty nine dollars and forty five cents we add the error in the check number four four three of thirty six dollars we subtract non-sufficient found check or bouncing checks of four hundred and twenty five dollars and sixty cents we also subtract the bank service charge of thirty dollars and the uh, we add the collection of notes receivable uh, that were collected uh, taking into consideration the interest that would uh, that was generated um, on the payment and the fee that was collected by the bank uh, so the amount would be one thousand and thirty five dollars and that brings the adjusted cash balance per books to twelve thousand two hundred and four dollars and eighty five cents and notice how the uh, the cash balance per books and the cash balance per bank now match each other after the reconciliation process now after the cash reconciliation uh, process the accountant also needs to record those adjustments to their books okay so in this scenario here we need to record the collection of the note receivable assuming the interest of fifty dollars uh, that has not been accrued and collecting fee uh, is charged to miscellaneous expense in that case the entry would be to debit cash of $1,035 and debit miscellaneous expense of $15 which represent the bank fee and credit those to notes receivable of $1,000 and interest revenue of $50. We also need an entry to correct the uh, check amount that was um, uh, entered uh, incorrectly the, that represents the cash disbursement journal shows that check number 443 was a payment on account to Andrea company a, which is a supplier and the correcting entry in that case would be to debit cash $36 and credit accounts payable $36 and also for the non-sufficient fund check or the bounced check as indicated earlier a non-sufficient fund check becomes an account receivable to the depositor so for that the entry would be to debit account receivable of four hundred and twenty five dollars and sixty cents and credit cash for the same amount the accountant also needs to recognize any bank fees uh, the check printing charges and other service charges that were collected by the bank directly deducted from our bank account uh, to recognize that and to record it in our uh, books we debit miscellaneous account for the total of those uh, fees and credit cash uh, for that same amount now using a bank account to help us with cash control also enables the EFT system the electronic fund transfer and this disbursement system uh, uses wire transactions to transfer cash balances between locations and this normally results in better internal control since uh, no need for cash handling or check handling by the employees now let's move on to the last learning outcome of this chapter which is reporting cash and to understand reporting cash we need to understand cash equivalents which are typically reported on uh, company statements now, what do we mean by cash equivalents cash equivalents are short-term highly liquid investments that are both readily convertible to cash and so near their maturity that their market value is relatively insensitive to changes in interest rates and also we have what is called restricted cash which should be reported separately on the balance sheet as restricted cash and not be included in the cash equivalents uh, section here you have an example for Delta Airlines balance sheet of course is a 
partial snippets of their assets section and as you can see two of the current assets uh, are cash and cash equivalents that they reported of 4,607 millions and restricted cash of 423 million. That's it for this chapter. Hope you guys enjoyed it and found it useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask using the uh, comment section below. And I'll be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you all for watching.